Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So my name's Lauren. I'm an alcoholic, and truly by the grace of God, I have been sober since April the 6th of 1987, um, which means that in a couple of weeks, God willing, which God's willing, I don't know why we say God willing, mm-hmm. God was always willing for me not to drink. Um, I was the problem. So assuming I don't screw anything up in the next couple of weeks, I will be celebrating 35 years, the first week of April. And Um, I get very emotional about that. It's a big number. And I had a moment of awareness a couple of weeks ago that, um, that I'm sober than longer than the people who helped me when I came in. And, um, that's, I thought I would be weller (laughs) or I thought they were weller than I think I am now. I don't know. Um, but I'm extremely grateful Um, for the life that I've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so it's really a privilege to be able to give back in any capacity. Um, So uh, step 11 is it's a tough, it's a tough thing to just start there. Um, So I'm just going to kind of back it up just a hair. Um, I, uh, you know, in, in we agnostics, it talks about lack of power. That was our dilemma. And we had to find a power by which we could live. Um, and that that's the main purpose of this book. And, and for me, I had to come to understand that I had a spiritual malady. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 17 years old. Um, and I for sure was powerless over alcohol. And, um, my, my life was, I, I was, um, on the streets and hustling pool, um, for a living, um, I don't know that I would call it a living. I was hustling pool to get money to drink and I had violated all of my values. I come from a very good family and, um, and I had set aside all of my values and put myself in hawk. And I was living in a manner that no one in my family had ever, um, no one had lived like that. And I knew it was wrong. And so I had somewhere along the way, not consciously made come to terms with the fact that I didn't have any value. And, um, and alcohol was necessary for me. Um, and sobriety was the problem, right? Alcohol was relief from the problem and I needed the alcohol. I couldn't stand sobriety. And so when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was not excited to be here. I did not want what you had. Um, I was (laughs) confined in treatment and then was sent to a all women's halfway house um, in Minnesota, and I was in Texas. And so if I had known where I was in relation to Texas, I'd have probably walked home, but I didn't know where the hell I was. And, um, and there were 60 women there, and it was horrible, and I was just not drinking. And I was saying all the things that I thought I needed to say just to get back to Texas, because really, I didn't want to stop drinking. I wanted to sort of fade the heat for a minute and get it together and come up with a plan. You know how we are with our plans. I was going to come up with a plan and I was going to get back out there. And um, I was 118 days removed from alcohol before I had an honest desire to stop drinking. And what happened at that point is not that I wanted what you had because I didn't, but I no longer wanted what I had. And that was enough to keep me in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I came back to Texas and I joined a home group and I got very busy in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to meetings every day and I had service commitments and all of my friends were sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I started going to college and I had a little job and but, but my life revolved around Alcoholics Anonymous. I was really in the middle of AA in a lot of ways. Um, And so I had unity with the fellowship that I had been given at my home group. And I had uh, service for sure. We did a ton of 12 step work back then. We had a detox room at my home group and went on a lot of 12 step calls, lots of service commitments, but I didn't have any recovery. I had not opened the book and started following the directions. And so I got to be about four years, not, not about, I was four years and two months removed from a drink and June the 11th of 19. 
91, I went to a meeting and I was in more pain than I had ever been in in my life. And I did not know what was wrong with me because I thought what I was doing was what we are supposed to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I had a drinking problem and I had stopped drinking. Why wasn't it better? And I went to a meeting June the 11th of 1991 and I raised my hand and I said, I can't stay with you guys anymore. I can't take it. And I didn't want to drink, really. I just didn't want to feel I was back with my original problem, right? Sobriety. <laughs> Sobriety was the problem when I was six. Sobriety was the problem when I was 12. Sobriety was the problem when I was 16, right? And now I'm back to this original problem. I'm, I'm not drinking and, um, and I couldn't take it. And one guy raised his hand and said, I'll talk to you after the meeting. And, and uh, we went out on the back porch and he said, um, you're a spoiled, rotten, vain little brat, and you want someone else to do your recovery for you, and you feel better. I thought that was rude. <laughs> he said, Alcoholics Anonymous is not for people who want it, and it's not even for people who need it. It's for people that do it, and you are not doing it. And I did not know that. He said, you have never bothered to open the big book and follow the directions. And I guarantee you that if you will start at the forward to the first edition and do every single thing it says to do to page 164, you will never feel like this again. And if you do, here's the key. If you do, I'll finance your drunk. And he had me. And so I made him write it down. We had those little white coffee napkins, ceramic coffee cups, and I passed that coffee napkin across the picnic table to him, and I said, write it down. And he did, and I still have that napkin. It's in my God box. Um, and, and that was June the 11th of 1991, and I became a student of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous on accident. I did everything that it said to do in the book to prove him wrong. Um, and I said every prayer, and I didn't mean a word of it. I didn't believe in any of the action that I took. I didn't believe in any of the prayers that I said. They said, do you believe there's a God? Sure. Right. Um, are you willing to turn your will and your life over to the care of him? Sure. Right. I didn't mean any of that. I didn't even know what that meant. I was just doing what I needed to do to get to my next drink because sobriety was unbearable. And I had made a commitment. And it turns out what you believe has nothing to do with staying sober. And how you feel about it has nothing to do with staying sober, right? And even what I thought about it had nothing to do with whether I could stay sober or not. It was entirely contingent on the action I took. And in spite of the fact that I didn't believe or feel like or think in agreement with any of what I was doing, the actions that I took rendered me sober and accidentally rendered me in relationship with a power greater than myself that I did not understand and was not interested in. Because it turns out I have a spiritual malady, not a drinking problem. And if I have a spiritual malady and the root of that spiritual malady is selfishness and self-centeredness, then unselfishness must be what recovery looks like. And if I had any power at all, I would just render myself unselfish. <laughs> I would just snap my fingers and we'd be good to go, right? But I don't have the power to do that. Lack of power is my dilemma. And I have to find a power that will allow me to live, right? And then later in the book, it says a life of sane and happy usefulness. Because sane and happy for me must be useful. I cannot be sane or happy if I am not useful. That is my truth. I have learned it the hard way. And so what about this power, right? And the truth for me is that I didn't have a problem with God. I was raised in a church. I have any problems with the church. I didn't have any problems with God, except I wanted his job, <laughs> right? The problem I had was not with him. It was with how am I going to get my way? Wonder if God's will for me is not my will for me, right? The old idea I had to let go of in order to get in right relationship with was that I knew something, that I knew what was going on. I had to let go of trusting my perception. And so step 11 for me, step 10 and 11, but step 11 for me um, allows me to stay in right relationship with 
that power that is necessary to keep me sober for this 24 hour period of time. Not tomorrow, not next month, right? This 24 hours is what I'm given the directions for. And when I follow those directions, regardless of how I feel or think or believe, right? When I follow those directions and take those actions, I end up in right relationship with a power greater than myself, right? It says sought through prayer and meditation, right? And um, prayer for me has at times been rote, <laughs> right? I just say the prayers. It feels like they're bouncing off the ceilings and no one is listening and is dark and it's awful and this hurts and yuck. And But when I say the prayers, I'm given the grace to get through those dark, yucky, awful, no good, very bad days, right? And um, meditation for me has been initially, I said, a time, they said, get an egg timer. And I would set the egg timer, right? And I mean, I'd set the egg timer for like three minutes. It might as well have been three years. You know what I mean, I was like, my foot's going and my hands are tapping and my head is pinging all over, but I would make myself not get up for three minutes. And then this old man, his name was Guy Stratton. He was one of my old timers. And um, Guy, he asked me one Sunday after a beginner's meeting, he said, do you fish? And I said, yeah, I love to fish. He said, let's go fishing. So me and Guy Stratton started going fishing on Sundays and we get out on the boat. And he wouldn't talk to me. And I would be, blah, 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 and he would say, shh. Right. And so I learned how to meditate fishing in the boat with that old man. Right. I had to learn to be still. I was stuck on a boat and he wouldn't talk to me. Um, and it was like a month before he told me what he was doing. It's very frustrating. Old timers are sneaky like that, though. Um, and so I have, you know, um, I have a practice today that works for me. What I believe is that it's in step 12, it says having had a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps. And I believe your spiritual awakening is entirely different than mine. We all have our own, right? Um, I don't know what yours looks like, nor, it, nor is it any of my business. I don't know what you believe, nor is that any of my business. The book is very clear about that. What your belief is, is none of our concern, right? Our concern is that you have one. What that is, not my deal, right? Um, I can tell you that I have a relationship with a power greater than myself today that is gracious and extravagant and available and loving and forgiving present um right and there's that line at the end of the night step promises and they always read are these extravagant promises we think not and whenever they read are these extravagant promises i always think hell yes they are um, if you crawled out from under the slide i crawled out from the life i have today is extravagant right it is amazing and it is a direct result of that grace so Every morning when I wake up, I believe, just my belief, every morning when I wake up, I wake up with untreated alcoholism, right? My brain is untreated until I say, God, please direct my thinking. Please let it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Please give me an intuitive thought, inspiration, or decision when I'm unclear today. Help me to relax and take it easy. Help me not to struggle. Please show me all through the day what my next step is to be and give me whatever I need to take care of any problems that might arise, right? That's just page 87, and, I mean, 86 and 87 um, on awakening, right? I'm just following the directions. That took me like, what, 15 seconds. And I'm connected. I don't feel connected sometimes, but I am connected, right? Because I trust the action. And so... I always laugh because it says we take, we ask, especially for freedom from self-will and are careful never to make requests for ourselves only. And in step 10 on page 85, it says thy will, not mine. I don't know if any other class of human has to include not mine. You know what I mean? I don't know if any other class of human has to say, and also don't let me get out of hand today. Right. But every day I have to say, and don't let me get out of hand today because my self will will jump in there and it sure looks like God's will. 
right? Sure does. So I ask for protection for my self-will. I pray for my family, my sponsees, my friends, people that I know are suffering and other concerns because it says that, right? We can choose to bring our own beliefs into this, right? And then it says, as we go through the day, we pause when we're agitated or doubtful. No, I don't. That is not in my nature. First of all, I don't get agitated. I get homicidal. And second of all, I'm never doubtful because I'm always right. So just the two words alone don't apply to me, right? Who's agitated? Who's doubtful? Not me. Not me, right? So I've been sober about 15 years, maybe 16 years, and I'm still slamming doors pretty regular. I got a house full of teenagers. Every one of them's mouthy as hell, right? They've all got opinions. They're all argumentative all day long. And every time one of them said or did something I didn't like, I slam a door. And my oldest daughter called my sponsor <laughs> and turned me in for my bad behavior. I was writing inventory about her this morning. Um, and that's a true statement. And uh, she's still my spiritual sandpaper, but... She called my sponsor and she said, mom slamming doors all the time and you should address that. So I show up at a meeting and he's there and he said, I heard you're slamming doors. I said, hmm. yeah. <laughs> and he said, you slam one more door, you're fired. I said, you can't fire me for slamming doors. He said, you slam one more door, you're fired. And I said, I don't think about it until after I've slammed the door. Right? Like I slam the door and then I go, oh, God, I wasn't supposed to do that. Right? But from the point that I'm angry to the point that I'm slamming the door, I'm not thinking about God or prayer. Or, right? I'm thinking about strangling a 12-year-old. Right? And he said, you're not pausing. And I said, I don't know how. I'm, I, don't, I don't think about it. And he said, are you asking God for the power to pause when you pray in the morning? And I said, no, why would I do that? You know, and I'm being all flippant. I said, it doesn't say that in the book. <laughs> he said, that's because not everybody's as sick as you are. Mm, fair point. Um, and so he said, why don't you try that? So I started the next morning and I didn't do that because I wanted a better relationship with God. And I didn't do that because I wanted to stop slamming doors. That old man that was sponsoring me was the only person I trusted in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I trusted him with my whole life. And I took that action to keep him from firing me, period. There was nothing spiritual about it, and it was entirely based on fear. I started asking God to give me the power to pause in the morning, and you know what? I stopped slamming doors. All of a sudden, the next time I reached back to grab that door, I had the grace to stop. I didn't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. I like slamming doors. I'm a door slammer, right? I miss the old phones. And there's enough people on here that know, right? The old phones that you could like hang up. You know what I mean? I love to hang up the old phone, right? And you can't do that with these anymore. It costs you $500 if you do that now. Um, but I, right, I, I didn't have a problem with that. Right, my kids did, but my kids were terrible. They were acting like maniacs, right? I didn't have a problem with that. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose the relationship that I had with my sponsor. And it was sufficient to create a change in my life. Right. I took an action that I didn't believe in, that I didn't want to do, that I didn't think made any sense, right? Because I didn't want to I, I, I did it out of fear period, out of fear. And it has drastically changed my life. It gave me just enough time to start to learn what it's like to access God as I go through the day. So that the conversation, what began to happen, and what I really want to say is that what began to happen for me in the mornings, I'm, I'm praying in the morning, and I'm following the directions as they're outlined in the book. And I have some other things that I do they're not conference approved, right? I have some other things that I do in the morning, but I always do 86 through 88. I have tried to not do 86 through 88, like got bored with it, sounds the same, do something else instead. Last about two days, freaks me out. 
can't handle it, go back and do it anyway, right? And so, and not everybody does, and there's no judgment there. This is just what works for me. So I do 86 or 88 and some other things. And then I would get busy in my day. I got, like I told you, I had a house full of kids, right? I, at different times in my life, things have been going on. I had a, a very um, high profile job for a while that required a lot. And, and so I would just get busy throughout the day, right? And that conversation that I started in the morning would stop. And I would start to manage and get irritated and have some low level fear going on. You know what I mean? And so then it'd be lunchtime and I'd be like, oof, okay, God, that was a rough morning, you know? And I'd kind of 10 step that morning, right? And then I'd go back into the afternoon, right? Just manage, control, fear, low level anxiety, picking up resentments. I'd get to dinner time or in the car on the way home from work, right? And I'd be like, whew, rough afternoon. Right. Go to a meeting. Meeting's good. Leave the meeting, get home, dinner, kids, bath, bedtime, the whole nine yards. Right. And now it's 930 at night. And one more time I'm hitting that spot of like, man, that was a rough evening. And when I started asking God for the power to pause as I go through the day, what happened is I started being able to start that conversation in the morning and carry it throughout the day. And so now I'm not taking these big chunks of time where I'm not connected. And then I got to where I really liked that. And so today, when I pray, I ask God to keep my eyes more on him than on me or you. Right? Please keep my eyes focused more on you, God, than on me or others. Right? Um, Because I like being in relationship with that power greater than me all day long. The end result of that and where I am with it today, I've got a God that I can talk to when Peppa Pig is blaring in the living room, when there's crying babies, um, when I'm at the hospital with somebody that I love and care about, when my sponsees call, um, when work calls, when I'm dealing with a difficult client at a family gathering, Um, it's constant. It's constant. Now, my conversations with him don't sound like what I thought they were going to sound like. I was telling, (laughs) I was telling my friend Macy earlier, I have a granddaughter who's 17. She has a baby that she had when she was 16 and all of her parenting advice is coming from TikTok. I have such opinions about this. Okay. Now, If I share them with her, she'll quit talking to me, right? Um, So my conversations with God a lot of times sound like, God, you know she's an idiot. (laughs) If you could fix it, right? So it's not all spiritual, right? I have to be able to talk to this power greater than me in all conditions. I have to be able to say, I'm so angry. I have no forgiveness. I I don't want to be around that person. I don't want to talk to you right now. I have to be able to say those things to this power that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because what I can't afford is to be disconnected. Right? It says, at certain times, the alcoholic has no effective mental defense against that first drink. The defense must come from a power greater than himself. What does that mean? Not all the time. At certain times, what time is that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Just certain times, right? No effective. Doesn't mean I won't think about it. Doesn't mean I'm not going to think of all the things that will go wrong if I take a drink. But I did that before I got to you. I knew what was coming when I picked up that drink. And I was powerless anyway, right? So what I know won't keep me sober, right? And I don't know when I'm going to get thirsty. I don't want to be thirsty, right? So how do I stay unthirsty? I got to be connected. I got to have a power greater than myself that will treat my spiritual malady in spite of myself. And it is in spite of myself. Right. There's still a lot of (laughs) I got a lot of pride, y'all. I have been sincerely begging God to release me from my pride in step seven for at least 25 years. Sincerely. 
I asked before that, but I didn't mean it. But for at least 25 years, I've been begging God to relieve me of my pride. It's still here. I still got it. I don't act on it like I used to. Thank God. But he and I are still talking about it a lot. I still suffer with unforgiveness, right? Um, I still get resentful and frightened. I still have anxiety and doubt, right? Um, agnosticism creeps in, all of those things, because I'm human. I'm never going to get any higher than human, right? That's the best I can achieve ever is human, right? And so I got to have something, that can allow me to have resentment, fear, anxiety, doubt, um, all of those things, and be unthirsty. And the only thing that I have found that has worked is following the directions as they're outlined in the book, which sets me immediately in right relationship with a power greater than myself, whether it feels like it or not. And how do I know that that's working? Because that's always the other question, right? Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. How do I know that it's God's will and that I've got the power to carry it out? I'm here. That's the truth. The circle is complete, right? The connection is complete when I'm out of self. If selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of the problem and selfishness Service is the remedy, right? And so how do I know that it's God's will and that I've got the power to carry it out? I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. I answer my phone when it rings. I sponsor people, right? I carry this message as it was carried to me to the best of my ability. And when I do that, I am remarkably protected from a drink. Remarkably protected. I don't know how much time I have left. Um, where am I at on time list? Five minutes. Okay. So the way that that shows up for me is that, um, and I'll tell this story and then be done with it, but it's the, the clearest way that I can um, connect the dots here is um, in October. Well, in 20, um, 2019 May this time, March of 2019, and we got a phone call. I had a granddaughter who was disabled, suffer, suffered from a horrendous condition called Rett syndrome, and she was 12, and um, she had grand mal seizures, and in March of 2019, she had a grand mal seizure that um, snapped her femur, um, and they called and said, you know, this has happened, and she's in the hospital, and we went, and while she was in the hospital, the doctors came in and said, listen, she's not going to recover from this. Um, this is not, we're going to, the femur is going to heal, but she's not right. This, the seizures are not going to stop. We've given her all the medicine that we can. And, um, and so, um, you know, we're going to, you're basically taking her home on hospice and I, she was in Louisiana and I had to come back to Texas and, um, and it was awful. There's just no way around that. It was just awful. It was an excruciating experience. And so I laid in the bed and loved on her until I had to come home. And, and in October of 2019, um, I got a phone call that she had passed. And I was heartbroken and relieved that she was no longer suffering because she was in a tremendous amount of pain. And she was really a little warrior angel. She was an amazing little spirit. And I was blessed to get to love on her. Um, but I was really sad and I was real worried about her sister. She had an older sister that had been really taking good care of her for a long time and immediately got in the car, called my sponsor, called my three best friends and got in the car and drove to Louisiana and, uh, made the funeral arrangements. And then we had to go to the funeral and we couldn't figure out how to get out of the house or the hotel. We were at a hotel and couldn't figure out. I had her sister with me and I couldn't figure out how to get out of the hotel. And I had been praying. And it really felt like my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. Um, I really, I knew intellectually that God was there, but I had no sense of it because of the grief. But intellectually, I knew. And I was talking to my sponsor, I mean, steady. <laughs> I was melting his phone down. He was in an assisted living facility by that time, and I was burning the line up. And, um, and he was reassuring me, right? And just do the thing, do the next indicated thing. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm breathing and praying and we're at the hotel and we can't figure out how to get in the car. 
because we knew we were going to go say goodbye to her. And we couldn't figure out how to do that. And my phone rang. And it was a girl in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had given my phone number to her three years ago, before, three years prior, 2016, at a meeting in a completely different town from where I lived. And she was calling because she wanted to get sober. And I could feel you. And I could feel God on the phone with her. That's how you got to me that day. That's how God shows up in my life. I needed a drink that day. I did, right? Like I, I wasn't thirsty because I was loving on my granddaughter, but it like a justifiable reason. Yes. Very in a grandkid. Check it. Right. But I didn't get thirsty because my phone rang. Right. And I knew what that was. God hugs me when my phone rings. Right. When you call and say, can you come share with us? I can feel that that opportunity to be of service is my sanity. It is my joy. Right. And so how do I know that I'm doing God's will? I'm here. Right. I answered that phone. I talked to that girl. I reached over and got Bella, my other granddaughter's hand. And I said, come on. I've got the phone here. I've got Bella in this hand. And we walked out to the car and I talked to her all the way to the funeral home. And then I said, I have to go, but I've given you four other numbers. I'm going to text them your number when we hang up. And are you okay? And she said, yeah. She said, are you going to work? And I said, no. I said, I got to go bury my granddaughter. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> Like, oh, you're loco. You know what I mean? Because if you're not in Alcoholics Anonymous, why would you take that phone call, right? It seems offensive. And I hung up the phone. And there was a rainbow over the funeral home. And we got out of the car and I was peaceful and I was calm and I was present. And yes, it was hard. No lie. It was hard. But I was peaceful and I was calm and I was flat footed and I was present. Right? Because you guys showed up. Alcoholics Anonymous showed up in that phone call. And it wasn't just her on the phone, right? It was all of you. I knew the phone rang because my sponsor was praying for me. I knew the phone rang because my best friends were praying for me. The phone rang because my sponsees were praying for me, right? That's how it works. The relationship with the God that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous is manifested in Alcoholics Anonymous, now, it also is out in my community, right? I am a member in good standing of the community where I live. I am currently coaching T-ball, so you should pray for me, um, right? But I volunteer in my community. I attend church in my community. I'm raising my grand, I have custody of my five-year-old granddaughter. She's been with me since she came home from the hospital. This was not what I thought I was going to be doing, and I wouldn't trade for it. I would not trade for it, right? Right. The God that I found here shows up in all of those areas. But first, first, he shows up through you in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I stay unthirsty. Right? And what is required of me is following the directions. I don't have to like it. I don't have to believe in it. And I don't have to think it works. If I will take the action that is outlined, I will be rendered sober. And I will be rendered in connection with, in relationship with, a power greater than myself. And I think that is miraculous. 35 years ago, I was under a slide. And I knew I had no value as a human. And now they bring me their babies. Right? What? That's nuts. Right? But not here, it's not. Here, it's just Wednesday. <laughs> right? Here, it's just another day. And, uh, and if I can take those actions, those five minutes worth of actions and get this, it's a pretty good deal. So I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, Gordon and Liz, for asking me to come and thank all of you for listening so patiently. I love you guys. I love AA.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.